This morning we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, particularly at verses uh, 10 through 13. So let me uh, read those for you as, as we begin. Beginning in verse 10, the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now we're going to stop there. The rest of the text, uh, Paul is going to go on to talk about what baptism is and what baptism isn't. But this really focuses on what we want to see this morning. Now, I think this morning's topic is, is important uh, to uh, each one of us because uh, you know as well as I do uh, from all the media around us, everything we see every day, the things that people are talking about, that we, we do live in an age of celebrities. You know, everybody has their heroes. Everybody loves their heroes. People are being singled out all the time for being exceptional at something, whether as athletes or as actors speakers or singers, governments or military leaders, or even thinkers or teachers, although perhaps they're not quite as popular as others. But the same thing is true in the church, and, and really that's what we need to focus on this morning, because we have our heroes as well. You know, we also appreciate those who excel at, at doing certain things, things that have to do with the Lord. And we particularly appreciate those that excel in something that is important to us. I think we all understand something about that. Uh, have you ever noticed how those who uh, have a burden for missions tend to talk about the missionaries who have most influenced their lives? And certainly there's a number of those, particularly those that have gone where no man has gone before, who have opened foreign lands up to the gospel and who have brought many people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And certainly Hudson Taylor would be numbered among them, or William Carey and David Brainerd among the uh, American Indians. I'm sure we can name many, many others. Uh, those that are interested in evangelism tend to admire those who have been very successful in evangelism, such as the Apostle Paul. Uh, and we might say he was a missionary as well. And George uh, Whitfield. You know, in theology, we all have our favorites. I have my, of course, my personal favorites. You probably know who those are by now. Uh, Jonathan Edwards and John Gerstner, who actually helped me learn more about Edwards. And, of course, R.C. Sproul, who's recently gone to be with the Lord. And, and lately, uh, Sinclair Ferguson has been a real blessing in sort of opening the Scriptures up in a way that, um, you know, we, we're not used to, to looking at them. Uh, those who love preaching often look to Charles Spurgeon those who love holiness, those who want to be more like Jesus, uh, which is something, of course, we should all want. Look to the Puritans quite often, uh, who are also, by the way, some of the best theologians that the Lord has ever given uh, to his church. Now, there's nothing wrong with, of course, having heroes. There's nothing wrong with appreciating those that we have found to be particularly helpful to us in the areas that are most important to us. But... We do need to be careful. Our passage reminds us this morning that our appreciation for these individuals can go too far. It goes too far when we forget, of course, the one to whom we're really indebted for these benefits, for these blessings, the one who is the real source uh, behind them. When we fail uh, to honor him for the benefits that we have received and instead focus on the servants through whom he gave us these things. When that happens, it really never bears good fruit in our lives. Now that's what Paul is reminding the Corinthians in our passage this morning, and of course, through this, he's also reminding us. Now first of all, let, let's consider the problem. 
This is only one of the problems of, of the, uh, the church at Corinth. You know, if you have read this letter recently, you know that Paul addresses many different issues, many different things that were dividing them, many things that were out of sorts and so forth. There were many problems, but he begins here with their division. He writes in verse 11, For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. They were divided. Now, the reason they were divided was because, as we've already seen, they had begun to identify themselves with different spiritual leaders in the church. Uh, a party spirit had developed, and we read about that in verse 12. Paul writes, Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. So the, these were the four that they had polarized around. Paul, who was the one who basically broke ground in Corinth. He was the one that initially brought the gospel to them. Apollos, if we read in the book of Acts, we find out that after Paul left Corinth, Apollos came. Uh, Luke calls him a very eloquent man, a very powerful speaker, someone who was mighty in the scriptures. And he came and he, he basically continued to teach the disciples that Paul had, uh, well, had, Paul had been used to bring to the Lord Jesus Christ. So he was continuing the work there. Now, Cephas, that's Peter, the Apostle Peter. We don't read that Peter was necessarily ever in Corinth. He was one of the original 12, and it's possible that the Jewish believers who were in Corinth had an easier time identifying with him uh, being Jewish and, of course, being one of the original uh, 12 apostles of the Lamb. And then the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we might wonder why Paul included that. I mean, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with saying, I am of Christ? Isn't that what we're all supposed to be saying? Well, Paul puts it in, in such a way that it can mean one of two things, really. He could either be objecting here by saying, you may be of these people, but I am of Christ. You're siding with those, but I'm siding with him. And that's really the point of his, of his sermon, or really this sermon, but his point here. Or he could be saying that there was a group that was merely claiming to side with Christ so that they could slight these other groups of people. Well, you may be of Paul, but I'm of Christ. You may be of Apollos, but, but I'm of Christ. In other words, it could still be a source of division. They were embroiled in a fight basically over which one of these was better. Who was the better teacher? Who was the better preacher? Who was the godlier example? Who was the greater man? instead of being careful to preserve the unity that the Spirit had created among them, and instead of yielding to the Spirit of God uh, as He was leading them in the direction of, of healing this division and being one, they were following their flesh instead and sowing seeds of division. So that's, that's the problem. Now, the, secondly, we see the solution to the problem. What does Paul do about it? Well, first of all, Paul urges them by the Lord Jesus Christ, by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, not based on his own authority, uh, but on the Lord Jesus whose body they were. He exhorts them, he urges them to work toward unity, to seek to be of one mind, to think the same thing, and of course the thing they should be thinking, which is the thoughts of the Lord Jesus Christ, so that they would speak the same thing and build up one another in unity. He exhorted them to be joined together, to heal the rift that was between them. He writes in verse 10, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now to help them see this more clearly, why it is they should be doing this, why they should be working towards unity rather than continuing to sow division, he asks three questions. The first one is in verse 13. Has Christ been divided? Is there more than one Savior? You're talking about these four men, but are there really four? Isn't there really only one? And doesn't this one Savior have only one body? I mean, isn't that what we as the church are to reflect, is essentially this oneness in the Lord Jesus? Now, 
This is how our Lord wants us to view the church, but that's not often how we view it because we see the church, you know, basically splintered into all these different groups, uh, meeting in various places, and we often think, well, there's not one church, but there's many churches. But really, there aren't many churches. The Bible refers to the church as one. There may be meeting in different places, but there's only one body, there is only one church, and anyone who is a part of that church through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is a member of that body, the same body to which we belong. Now, perhaps if, if the whole church began to think more along these lines, it might help heal some of the divisions that exist within the church that mar the, the, basically the, uh, the Lord's testimony through his church today. One of the things that um, the Roman church likes to point to among Protestants is the fact that we are so divided. And the fact is, we are. So we need to pray that the Lord would help us really as, as um, an entire community of those who believe to reflect that unity in the Lord Jesus. Secondly, Paul asks in regard to those who were looking to him as as the, basically their hero, as their example, as the one that they identify with. Again, in verse 13, Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Paul is basically saying this, some of you are claiming me as your spiritual leader, but, but who am I? I'm not the Savior. I'm not the one who gave his life, who laid down his life on the cross to take away your sins, who bore God's wrath for you so that you might live forever. He isn't, but of course Jesus is. And along these lines, he says, thirdly, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And again, he could mean one of two things by this. Um, he, is he, he's, he could be saying either, I'm not the one who authorized baptism. You know, when Jesus says, I want you to baptize him in the name of, of Christ, or that's, that's basically the authorization. He's saying, I'm the one who told you to go do this. So it could mean that, or it could mean this. You were not united to me in your baptism, were you? Baptism really is, um, is really a, a picture of the Spirit's work of uniting us to the Lord Jesus Christ. When we are baptized, we are baptized into Him. It's a picture of the Lord putting us in uh, the Holy Spirit putting us in the Lord Jesus Christ where all the blessings are, where life begins to flow through us, where uh, He is applied to us, His sacrifice is applied, and it, it washes away all of our sins. So Paul is saying this, you weren't united to me in, in baptism. I'm not the one who sent my spirit to renew your souls. I'm not the one who washed away your sins and raised you to life. Again, Paul is saying essentially this, take a step back and, and look at what you're saying. Look at what you're doing. This is what you're really saying of all these men as long as you identify the blessings with them and not with the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Is that what the Spirit of God would lead you to do? Obviously not, but your flesh, the sin that's inside of you, would certainly do that. He writes in chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. For you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? And are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? In other words, aren't you living like the people of this world, admiring other people rather than looking to the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, finally, Paul then, after you know, telling them essentially what it was they were doing and, and really how blasphemous that is, he puts everything in perspective and he tells them what they ought to be doing instead, how they should be viewing him and, and these others, telling them how they should view their spiritual heroes and, and showing us how we should also keep ours in the place they should be. He says, first of all, we should see them as servants, Servants that the Lord raised up for our good. Servants that he sent to bless us. Now, we benefited through their ministry, but it was the Lord who actually gave this benefit. It wasn't them. See how easy it is to confuse these things. 
Paul writes in chapter 3, verse 5, What then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed. Through whom okay, you believed. Even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. Now Paul goes on to say it's true that he planted the seed. He was the one that brought the gospel to them on his second missionary journey. And yes, Apollos watered the seed. He came to Corinth after Paul and after Aquila and Priscilla had essentially corrected him and helped him better to understand the gospel and he continued to build them up in God's word. But neither Paul nor Apollos made that word effective either to save or to build up. God was the one who did that. He was the one who sent his spirit to raise the dead through the preaching of the gospel, to raise them to new life under Paul's preaching. He was the one who sent his spirit to build them up under Apollos' teaching. And then when you step back even a little bit further and understand if God had not called Paul and Apollos into his kingdom, if he had not gifted them, if he had not called them to be ministers of the gospel, if he hadn't sent them to Corinth, they wouldn't have been there in the first place. The fact that they were there and had the ability to do what they were doing also all came from God. This was his doing. And this he provided out of his infinite love for his people. And so Paul concludes in verse 7 of chapter 3. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters, not the one who evangelizes or the one who teaches, is anything but God who causes the growth. He is the one who is to be honored. He is the one to receive the credit and the glory. He's the one who gave the benefit. He caused life and he caused growth. Now, both Paul and Apollos and all these others are going to be rewarded for being faithful to do what it is that the Lord had actually called them to do according to their faithfulness. Paul writes in verse 8, Now, he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. But they always had to keep in their own minds, as well as in the minds of their hearers, that they were only the laborers, the workers in the field. They were only the workers or the laborers who were basically building the house. The house, the field, actually belonged to God. And so did the success or the fruitfulness uh, of their ministry in the field and on the house. It depended entirely upon God. And so he concludes in verse 9, For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. He's the one who ultimately makes the difference, and so he is the one who is to receive all the glory. Okay, so that's the point that Paul's making here. Now, let's think about different ways that we can apply this that I think would be helpful. The first thing the Lord wants us to see is this, that no matter how much we love and appreciate those that the Lord has used to minister to us, whether those who first brought the gospel to us and were the means of our salvation, or those who taught us and built us up in the truth, whether they're alive today, still on the earth today, or have already gone to be with Him in glory, whether we benefited from their example or the insights from their teaching, we do need to remember a couple of things. They did not save us. Okay, the Lord saved us. The Lord was the one who gave us a son. The Lord was the one who gave us a spirit. He is the one who gave us life in the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to remember that though they may have taught us, they are not the ones who made us grow. They were an instrument to that end, but the Lord is the one who actually made us grow. He's the one who sent the Spirit of God to illumine the word of God to make it beautiful to make it acceptable and you know to change us he's the one that makes it effective to save and to build us up so that we might become more like Jesus I mean think about this two people can hear the same gospel one is saved and one isn't saved okay the same servant doing the same exact thing but God is giving the benefit gives to one doesn't give to the other many people hear the same teaching uh, in, in particular places, some are blessed, some grow, and others don't. Again, God is the one who makes the difference. 
We need to remember again, too, who it was that actually raised these people up and equipped them to do what they're doing. Uh, the Lord did that, too. Now, we can appreciate, of course, what others do for us, and we, we do appreciate them. You know, I have very high you know, appreciation for a number uh, that the Lord has given to His church. Uh, these, you know, the servants that He sends to us, but we really need to remember to give Him the credit for the benefit. They plant, they water, but God is the one who causes the growth. Now, I think the Lord wants us to see, secondly, that He didn't give us these servants to divide us, but He gave them to unite us. And sadly... I can, we can't say it's their fault that this has happened, the servant's fault, but there's been this effect within the history of the church upon people who listen to, you know, uh, ministers, teachers, theologians, evangelists, missionaries, and, and they tend to appreciate them so much that they end up dividing from other people. Sometimes our appreciation for someone, for their zeal, for their ability in a particular area, their insights into God's Word can make us overly appreciate them that we begin to look down on those who don't see things or do things the same way that, that they do. We need to be careful that their influence on us is really what the Lord intended originally when He raised them up and sent them to, into the church basically to minister to us. What He intended them to do was to make us more like Jesus. He intended them to be a uniting influence to make us, again, like Jesus and not like the people of this world, not a dividing influence. Again, sadly, it's not necessarily their fault. Sometimes it is, but, but sometimes it isn't their fault. Uh, here's just a personal example. I, there was a, a minister I knew one time who, who said to me when I told him I really appreciated the Puritans. He says, I don't like reading the Puritans because when I read the Puritans, when I look around at everybody, all I can see is sin. And, and so I just feel like condemning all of them. Now, I know what he's talking about because I know the Puritans initially had that same effect on me. But the problem that both he and I had was that we used what the Puritans said to examine other people instead of using it to examine ourselves. Because if we had, then we would have been humbled as we, you know, saw what it is that the Lord actually calls us to be and we saw how far short we actually fell. And that would have made us better servants. Now, that's what the Puritans actually intended by what they wrote, but that's not always what, what happens. We're never more like the Lord Jesus Christ than when we are humbled and we're more, never really more useful to Him, particularly in healing divisions, than when we're first humbled by our own contributions to those divisions. So we need to learn, uh, secondly, uh, really not to um, let the servants of the Lord divide us, but rather let them humble us and unite us because that's why the Lord actually sent them. I mean, that's why, that certainly was Paul's intent, that was Apollos' intent, that was Cephas, uh, Peter's intent, and everybody who ministered there, that was why the Lord sent them but that's not the way they took it. And so we need to make sure we don't do the same thing. Now, he wants us to see, thirdly, that when we plant, when we do that work of planting, when we bring the gospel to others, and when we water, either by reinforcing the gospel or discipling those uh, who have come to him uh, through the gospel, uh, that there are going to be some who are going to be saved through that evangelism, there are going to be some who are going to be built up through that teaching because the Lord is working through us. Now, what I'm saying here is this. We can have confidence in evangelizing. We can have confidence in, in just teaching or helping other people see things. If it were left entirely up to us, we would have no confidence. What can I do? I can do nothing. No one would be blessed. But because the Lord says He raises us up so that, we, that he might work through us, we have the confidence that he actually will do that. There will be fruit. There, but again, obviously, it will uh, be from him. Now, finally, he wants us to see that when others actually do receive benefit, 
from our evangelism, from our discipleship, from our teaching, we must not take the credit for it. We need to give him all the glory. Now, Paul asks a question later on in, in the 1 Corinthians in chapter 4, verse 7, and this is just a paraphrase. What do we have that we have not received? You know, do you have anything you can say that wasn't given to you? You know, your existence, your life, your, your, your breath, your food, your food and covering, Christ's spiritual gifts. Is there anything that you can say that you have that you have never received? Well, no, everything we have has been received. And then so Paul asks the follow-up question, so then how can we boast as though we didn't receive it? We can't, okay? We, we need to remember that everything that we have is from the Lord. Everything that we have, He has given to us. It's on loan to us. We're only stewards, basically, of these gifts and of these graces. So that when we use these things and others are blessed by them, it's because God is the one who is giving the blessing. He gives us the equipment. He gives us the tools. But even in the exercise of the tools, the only ones who benefit from it are the ones that He is directly benefiting through these things. So the bottom line is, is simply this. God is to get all the glory. If he does something good from you don't, or through you, don't pat yourself on the back. If he brings somebody to faith in Christ, don't say, you know, I guess I must be a great evangelist. If somebody benefits from your, you know, something you, you teach them, don't say, I must be a great teacher. You know? And don't, don't take the credit for these things. But give the credit where the credit is due and that is to the Lord. Out of his love, he's called us into his service that we might minister, and it's a great privilege, and we'll be blessed for having done this. But again, if anyone benefits from it, it's purely the Lord's work. It's his doing. And so we are to give the glory to him and not take it to ourselves. And that's really what the Lord's table reminds us of this morning as well, isn't it? Because if Jesus had not laid down his life, what would we have? We'd have the flesh, we'd have no gifts, we'd, be, we'd really have a spirit that's, you know, that's contrary to God. We really wouldn't be able to do anything that, that's spiritually useful. It all boils down to God's plan to send His Son into the world so that He might save us and might make us His servants so that He might use us. So let's think about that as we bow in a moment of uh, prayer. And let's... Um, Let's ask that the Lord would, would help us to take what we've just heard and uh, apply it as we need to apply it to our lives.